Yesterday we passed a bit of a, a milestone, one that I'm incredibly proud of. It's a milestone in a journey that's been, I don't know, maybe six or seven years now. And it's made me reflect on the, the genesis of the idea, how it came to be what it is today. And that idea was labs, our free range of kind of gems, hidden, unpolished diamonds. But we have to roll back even further to get true context on this. I'd say about 20 years ago, I'd long given up any aspirations of being a film composer because I'd flunked out of school and I didn't go to music college. So I was uh, a struggling and very unsuccessful record producer who would occasionally engineer on some of the kind of first wave intelligent drum and bass with people like LTJ Bookham, MC Conrad, he used to mix and produce the vocal sessions for stuff like Logical Progression and uh, I think Orchestral Jam was a biggie. It also meant I got to work with other drum and bass producers, uh, often that MC Conrad introduced to me. And this is in the days when you didn't really have many commercial libraries, maybe Distorted Reality had just come out, but also we were severely restricted with the kind of, the size of a number of samples we could use within any given outboard sampler units as they were in those days. So people were very kind of fascinated by each other's use of sound. We had to be resourceful in those days. And this one producer always had these amazing sounds, but we always got the impression that he was getting them from like, not just illegal sources, but like really illegal, like Rolling Stones records, Elvis, that kind of stuff. So when pressing him about, come on, where'd you get that sample from? He'd just go, you know, from the lab. And it became a bit of an in, in joke amongst the people I made music with, you know, people go, wow, where's that sound from? And you'd go, the lab. An in joke that's stuck to this day. So, as I'm sure many of you know, 12 years ago, we founded Spitfire Audio, Paul and I, it's just two of us. I kind of did the packaging and the, some of the branding, that kind of stuff, and Paul did everything else. And uh, we were a private members club, really. Just um, a few of our friends would say, within two years, there's maybe 30 people using this private orchestral sample library. And for reasons that I won't bore you with today, we decided we needed to go commercial. Uh, I designed the original website. This next website we needed to build in a shop because basically we were doing everything by hand up and that, until that point, sending stuff out manually or even dropping it off at people's studios. So I recruited a fantastic friend and an amazing music editor who was also really good at the internet, a guy called James Bellamy, who's still with us to this day and he created created the first proper website we had with a shop. And that website was actually designed by my brother, Keaton Henson. Paul and I had a chat about how we really enjoyed the commercial success of Spitfire, which was fairly kind of muted at that point, but it was great for us. But what we didn't like is how deep and how perfect we had to make the samples. We talked about how actually still our favourite samples were the slightly more, the much less kind of deeply sampled samples that we had in our private collections, or rather, as I referred to, in my lab. And I suggested to Paul, well, can we not sell some of these? Paul and I just thought, well, people are just not going to want to pay for stuff that's so kind of rough and that's so basic. And we simply couldn't uh, handle the predicted customer service kind of burden. So I said, why don't we just give them away and say we're not doing any customer service on these? I said, you know, sounds from my lab, drawing on this in-joke from our drum and bass producer. I said, let's call it labs. And immediately threw James under the truck by suggesting that people get it for free, provided they donate to UNICEF via Just Giving and answer a survey. Poor James had a week to work all of this, I think it's called API stuff out, put it together and we launched it on Christmas Eve. God, that was such a mistake. Hadn't realized is that we'd boy, created those two magical ingredients in business, demand and scarcity. We'd been a private club and when we became commercial, we were very expensive. People really wanted our stuff, but couldn't afford it. So when we launched labs, it went fucking mental, but like really mental. So we launched with the soft piano, which was then called the felt piano, dry vibraphone, a little dulcimer hammer dulcimer thing, and toy piano, all recorded at Air Adele Studios, which is my favorite small studio in London. I felt very much kind of vindicated 
in my adoration of that studio when Nick Cave and Warren Ellis recorded their score for the proposition there. So I think two of these libraries were in my lab already, the soft piano and the toy piano, which I used on the score for The Secret of Moonacre. The vibraphone and the dulcimer I sampled specifically for labs. And so the madness began in a nice way. Well, kind of. Within the first 12 hours, we'd made 15 grand for UNICEF. And bearing in mind that I believe each lab's instrument was two pounds sterling. So about $2.50. So our initial, Oscar, our initial outing with labs, whilst was very successful, destroyed a Christmas for Paul and I. The felt piano immediately kind of took off as a bit of a, a hit and since then has been downloaded just an eye-watering amount of times and I hear it on so many things and the reason I kind of hear it all the time is I purposely played it's either D4 or D5 pedal up sample I played it with my nail my fingernail so it's kind of like a watermark that I hear on absolutely everything so because of its success we just decided to kind of start making and rolling out more labs Stanley Gabriel's first sample library that he kind of did himself was the Watt on drums, beautifully engineered, beautifully mixed. And I guess it started becoming like an ideas incubator, started teaching us about what people liked and how people worked. And I'd say the biggest lesson that we learned was that people really enjoyed character. The soft piano, or felt piano, was, was a one-trick pony, but boy, was it a good trick. The Watt on drums weren't deeply sampled, but they were a great kind of basic, good sounding drum kit. We realized that if you got the character right, people didn't necessarily need things to be deep sampled. And if there was a single most important revelation to us, it was when we released Scary Strings on Labs. Now this was something I designed for a TV series I was working on called Sinbad. I was having to do, I know I've told this story so many times, so sorry if I'm boring some of you. I was basically having to write about 24, 25 minutes of music a day. Fully orchestrated, mastered, done. No live orchestra to go on it. And I wanted to involve some live uh, players. So I thought, well, maybe they can help me actually uh, earn a, a lunch break. And what I wanted to do was basically create long, evolving string phrases so I could hold down, say, a C minor chord, put the sustain pedal on, and take a bite out of the sandwich. Now, a lot of people think that's apocryphal, but it's absolutely honest truth. I designed a sample library so I could continue writing music whilst eating a sandwich. So we decided to put these out as a lab's instrument, and um, there's this thing called VI control, which we used to be quite active on and it just set it alight. People were like, this is extraordinary, these things. It's like, you write music that does nothing, but it still does so much, this and the other. So that became the beginnings of the concept of the Evo Grid. And I don't know how many different Evo Grid libraries we've made now, but they're substantial. And it's not just the style of evolving long samples, but also it inspired the little grid interface, which we're using on loads of different products now. So you can see how Labs really greatly influenced the creative direction of Spitfire. In this first outing with Labs, the UNICEF UK office got in touch with us to say that we were the second biggest donator off the Just Giving site to UNICEF in the UK, which is incredibly proud. And we decided to kind of up the ante there and up the amount that uh, the samples cost to, to $3 and uh, for us to uh, donate these equally, $1 each to UNICEF, Safer London, and Magic Breakfast, which are two really important London children's charities, troubled times that we live in. It was never really kind of going to go as global as we wanted it to, for us this to kind of, these sounds to bring musicians together to talk about how we make music together. We were enjoying the community so much, we wanted to throw the net wider. And we believed that for some part of the world, you know, three dollars was a hell of a blocker, alongside the fact that you also needed a full, legit version of contact, which was expensive. So we decided to kind of wrap up labs as a contact thing and make our own plugin. So we recruited our own in-house software development team headed up by Martin the Genius Robinson and we went into partnership with Us2, a design consultancy, to create the UX, the GUI. That process took about six months and we're really, really chuffed with the end results. And so Labs 2.0 was released and our fantastic designer came up with concepts of Labs actually standing for let's all become something. For me, it'll always be 
that drum and bass producer. Whenever I look at it, I think, if only you knew. Soft piano is still our biggest uh, mover on that. And we decided instead of people paying uh, or donating to charity to simply to give a percentage of our gross income per annum to these three charities, which we're really proud to be in partnership with. So the milestone that I talk of, well, yesterday we crossed the threshold of our millionth download of Labs plugins. And it's just something I'm so incredibly proud of. I'm kind of a recovering musician and I've played in every size venue from, you know, the hinge and sprocket in the East End with one man and a whippet barking after each song that we played, all the way to, I think, about 70 or 80,000 people at the Indira Gandhi Stadium in India. I used to tour with a guy called Peter Andre. So whenever I see numbers where Spitfire's concerned, like units sold or, or people who have bought something, I can always imagine different venues. Oh, that's the Wembley Arena, that's the SECC in um, Bournemouth. But a million for me is just an abstract notion. And all I can say is it simply fills me with a, a cognitive dissonance coupled with total pride and thanks to all who have supported us and have encouraged us to continue, but also for just getting it, that actually in order to create brilliant samples, they don't have to be perfect, they don't have to be detailed, they just have to be, I don't know, inspiring. So if there is anything you feel you could do for us in return, one would be, you know, please tell all and sundry about Labs. Let's not keep it a secret. It's something that brings us all together. But more importantly, linked below are some of those charities who are desperate for help in these quite difficult times. So if you felt able to donate anything to the charities down below, above and beyond what we already give away as Spitfire, that would be, well, I offer you my humble thanks in advance for that. Thanks, as always, for watching. If you haven't subscribed, please do. Ding that bell if you want to be notified the next time I put a video up. And one of those, for the work of those wonderful charities would be fantastic. See you next time.